you for joining us for this evening's discussion. The Basser Center for BRCA at Penn Medicine's Abramson Cancer Center is the first comprehensive center devoted to funding research across the globe, educating providers and patients, and advancing care for individuals with BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations. Dr. Edward and Mary Prostick have generously established this webinar as part of the Elizabeth Prostick Memorial Outreach Program in memory of their daughter. The Basser Lizzie Prostick was an amazing young woman who believed in the promise of tomorrow. And though her tomorrows were cut short, we can celebrate and sustain her optimism. Lizzie lived large. She loved the stage and brought it to life with her voice and her energy as a talented child and as she grew into a woman. Her world was full of loving friends and family and success in class, in sports, with girls and with boys. Sophomore year of college, Lizzie met Michael Lundblad, a liberal and an English major. He got a preview of her leanings when he saw her quizzing a friend about senators. But she learned to love camping. He learned about couture. In political opposites, Michael and Lizzie spent 10 years together, marrying their minds and their passions. Michael loved her boldness and her softness, her interest in so many different types of people, and ability to remember the small details of their lives. The time she made to talk with her grandmother, her pearls, her red shoes, red shoes that said she was not afraid to be noticed. She was not afraid. Lizzie's intellect and drive were rewarded with exciting opportunities. She blazed through the University of Pennsylvania and into the halls of government, determined to win in every venue and for every cause that was important to her. Her work for senators and on committees quickly made her a Washington insider. She rose to chief privacy officer and senior advisor to the Secretary of Commerce before being lured away to the private sector. Not yet a lawyer, she was named managing director at Sun and Shine, Nath, and Rosenthal in Washington, D.C and was completing her law degree at night at George Washington University when she died. When Lizzie was awarded a posthumous degree at the law school graduation, the entire audience stood in tribute to her spirit. Lizzie was 31 when she was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer, and her daughter Harper was four months old. Michael did research. Lizzie didn't want to know the odds, expecting to beat them. But the cruel reality was that although breast cancer is generally curable, metastatic breast cancer is not. And they found little support to help them deal with the psychological and emotional realities they had to face. In her last months, Lizzie and her family began to envision an online support network that would show patients with metastatic disease that regardless of how long they have to live, they have the ability to control how they live this was Lizzie's final cause, and one which will be honored. Lizzie wanted to see her daughter's first birthday. She didn't make it, but she lives on in the people who loved her, and through grants such as this one being made in her name. And in truth, none of us knows how long we'll live, so we all should listen to Lizzie and make the most of every tomorrow. Live large, live strong, and wear red shoes. The Basser Center is proud to be part of this mission by providing life-saving information and hope to individuals and families worldwide. Today's program will address updates in hereditary cancer care and recent scientific advancements. This presentation will be archived and available on our website, basser.org. 
please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A function during the presentation. And I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Susan Domchek is a board certified medical oncologist, Vassar Professor in Oncology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, Executive Director of the Vassar Center for BRCA, Director of the Marianne and Robert McDonald Cancer Risk Evaluation Center at the Abramson Cancer Center, and a Senior Fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. Dr. Domchek has committed her career to pursuing research related to genetic susceptibility to breast and ovarian cancer, particularly with regard to risk assessment, screening, prevention, and treatment. She is especially interested in the development of targeted therapeutics in this population, as well as the long-term impact of risk-reducing interventions. And Dr. Domchek, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sam, and thanks you all for joining us today. Uh, we have a lot to get through, and I know that the, the thing that people most value in all this is the question and answer part. So I'm going to go through uh, some research updates uh, rather briefly and then try to focus on some of the questions that were submitted in advance. The Basser Center's mission is to use cutting edge research in basic and clinical sciences to advance the care of individuals living with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And this spans everything from basic science to prevention and treatment, as we'll show you. One reminder is that we have an annual scientific symposium. Our ninth annual symposium will be on May 11th and 12th. It will unfortunately be virtual. We're really hoping uh, for 2022 to all get together in person again. However, we did notice that this year's virtual symposium was attended by more than 600 people. So this does give us uh, additional reach. So feel free to spread the word. We have international faculty lectures and we'll be presenting the global prize. Um, this does have accreditation for CMEs and uh, uh, CNEs, as well as CEUs for the JANC counselors. The registration will be opening soon on our Bassler website, and we will once have, again, have a breakthroughs and discovery panel, which is more lay oriented. Uh, this will be on May 12th, so keep that all in mind. Our Basel Global Prize this year will be awarded to Dr. Bella Kaufman um, in Israel. She has been a true leader in the field of clinical therapeutics for BRCA1 and 2, um, and she'll give a fantastic keynote. So uh, uh, please uh, put, it on your, uh, put it on your calendar. Uh, it'll, it will be a great lecture. Just to review some outreach, uh, we again you know, have strived to do this virtually. Uh, and we had seven events in collaboration with the Basel Young Leadership Council, the Basser part, uh, Parents Leadership Community that are all available on Basser's YouTube channel. And we've also had our annual um, re research overview uh, dealt with issues of sexual, sexuality and intimacy after mastectomy, uh, how to talk to your family members about BRSA, um, racial disparities. Uh, and we have external organization sponsorships with FORCE, to share at Living Beyond Breast Cancer and Let's Win, which focuses on uh, pancreatic cancer. And we've launched two major initiatives last year. One was the Latinx and BRCA initiative uh, to develop awareness and provide education and resources in, in Spanish and build a community for the US Latinx community of uh, individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. We know that there's a vast uh, amount of under testing in minority communities, in, including those of uh, uh, Latina descent and also those uh, in the black community. And we're trying to approach both of these issues. So on the first initiative, we developed Spanish uh, uh, materials um, and uh, uh, developed uh, outreach to community, uh, uh, community centers. And likewise, in the Black and BRCA initiative, uh, which launched in September, uh, we are, are trying to empower individuals to understand their history, uh, their family history, and put in more resources um, and stories uh, that are relevant to this community. And uh, we'll hear about, you'll hear more about those over the next year. We've actively tried to decrease barriers during testing. This is an ongoing initiative. We have studies using telegenetics, digital health platforms, point of care uh, 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 testing. And we just know that too few people get testing and particularly those at the highest risk of disease. We also know that family members don't get tested even once a mutation is known. So we've initiated cascade testing initiatives for other family members, including something called ECHO. Um, and this is all just to prep ourselves uh, for a continued decrease um, in the barriers to genetic testing and the opportunity at some point uh, for uh, population screening. 
I'm going to highlight a few of these initiatives. One, this was led by uh, Kate Nathanson and one of our fellows, uh, Kelsey Law Min. And Penn has really tried to optimize the electronic medical record. And I know you hear a lot of complaints from providers about the electronic medical record, but there's a lot of good things that it can do as well. And so we're, we've really uh, been doing a lot of work trying to make genetic information easily seen and also to enable um, automated reminders and even identify individuals who are good candidates for testing. Um, and we've actually been seen as a leader in this area and we've provided demonstrations to a lot of other academic institutions. And our work is felt to be generalizable because the platform we use called EPIC is used by about 50% of, of systems, uh, hospital systems in the United States. In addition, Angela Bravery is uh, uh, leading the eReach study, which is a randomized study of web-based delivery uh, for genetic counseling services, but with a wraparound of medical providers and uh, genetic counselors. And again, it randomizes people to genetic counseling either by web or uh, in person. Um, and this is um, going to be uh, 400, um, 420 uh, patients. And uh, we're well on our way uh, to uh, uh, enrolling on this, but we encourage you to uh, let us know about patients because this is any patient with metastatic breast, uh, prostate, or, or uh, ovarian or pancreatic cancer in any state in the United States. So if you hear about people who are having trouble getting access, this is how they can come in. Um, and we can, again, we, uh, Angela's genetic counselors are certified in all states and we can provide genetic services in the home collaborate with local physicians, and again, have this embedded in the medical model and yet um, uh, make sure that these individuals have access. Uh, again, these are ways to reach the eReach study. I don't anticipate people are taking notes on this call, but this is listed on the basser.org website. Uh, so if you'd like more information, please feel to free to contact us. We did finish a study called the BEFORE study, the BRC Founder Outreach Study, um, enrolling, enrolling more than 4,000 patients uh, with a collaboration of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber, uh, and UCLA. Um, and we've learned a lot from the study. This involved a digital health platform. But what we learned most is, honestly, we've got to engage the primary care physicians if we want uh, more individuals to be tested because people want to hear from their primary care providers and they want to have a recommendation to get testing. So we have more uh, work underway in this space. Uh, we have developed this point of care testing model using a video uh, for metastatic prostate and pancreatic cancer patients. And since 2018, you can see that we've enrolled, uh, we've tested nearly a thousand patients with a, a video. Um, and these are all individuals who in the past really weren't getting tested. Uh, nine, about 9% 9 of our patients have a mutation in some gene, about three to 4% in BRCA1, 2 or PALB2. Um, and this has uh, it, particularly important for, because for these individuals, there are now specific therapeutics and trials that are available for them if they have mutations in these genes. And so we've been working on ways to integrate this with the EHR, um, using a lot of the things that Dr. Nathanson has developed. Um, and uh, we're trying to streamline this to decrease the workload and yet, um, um, and yet have this available for our patients. We have a very large biobank uh, to look at changes in the blood that may be able to better diagnose cancers at an earlier stage. We now have over 800 BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers throughout the world, uh, throughout uh, in our study, and we've been collaborating with multiple centers, including Dana Farber, Johns Hopkins, and a group in Poland, uh, to use this biobank wisely to uh, understand some of these issues. Uh, so we're really grateful for the research participation of our patient, uh, research participation of many of our patients. We're very interested in the immune response in those with mutations in BRCA1 and 2 as compared to those individuals without mutations. And actually, even before COVID, uh, we were looking at this using seasonal flu vaccine um, and uh, enrolled a great number of, uh, this was a study developed at the end of 2019, and we're doing blood collections prior to and post vaccine. We had a few patients in 2019, uh, but we're enrolled in 2020 as well. And uh, we are going to, to try to look a little bit more at, at this uh, with COVID-19, again, pre and post a vaccine. And we've been collecting preventative and therapeutic mastectomy specimens to do detailed immune analysis. And again, these collections are, have just started, um, but it's been uh, quite successful so far. 
We've been interested, uh, if, if you joined us last year, you know that we're looking at genetic modifiers to see uh, whether we can identify individuals with BRCA1 or 2 mutations who may be at higher or lower risk of developing uh, breast and ovarian cancer. And uh, uh, led by Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, we'll be involved in a collaborative effort to look at this. Uh, we're about to launch this study. And so these are for individuals who've not had a mastectomy. And we want to understand how individuals might be able to use this uh, might use this information uh, to help their decisions. Um, it's it's a little tricky, and it's and and uh, the information um, you know in the end of the day may not change uh, many people's minds, but we want to get a better idea of it. We're very interested in preventative opportunities. I mentioned last year um, a uh, a uh, clinical trial uh, that we were uh, launching, um, and whoops, it's not, it's uh, yeah, opened and approved. Yes, uh, that we were launching um, for a vaccine trial. There had been a prior prior study of individuals uh, who had cancer that had received a vaccine again targeting something called HTERT. Um, and it showed that this was safe and um, uh, uh, safe and developed an immune response. So we actually did uh, get FDA approval and launched a trial right as COVID hit to give an experimental vaccine to people in the midst of a pandemic. So we actually did put the trial on hold um, during the worst of the pandemic. Uh, we've uh, decided to sort of get it going again, just as the COVID vaccine started to be given out. Um, and we actually can't vaccinate to both at the same time. So this study is live. We're first going to do um, a cohort of individuals um, who've had prior cancer and then administer this uh, vaccine to healthy individuals. Uh, and But realistically, uh, this will be after people get their vaccines, uh, then we'll, uh, COVID vaccines, uh, then we'll offer them uh, this trial. But we're very excited about it. And uh, no one really could predict that we would be um, uh, if you will, occupied by, by the pandemic for the last year. There's other things coming in addition to vaccination. Uh, there are uh, 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 drugs called rank ligand inhibitors. Uh, you may have heard of Prolia or denosumab or Xiva. It's all the same drug. And uh, this has been shown in mouse models to pre potentially present beer, prevent BRCA1-related breast cancer. Uh, this trial is uh, led out of Austria. Judy Garber at, uh, at Dana-Farber is the uh, overall PI in the United States. This trial hasn't quite started yet, but we'll be doing so soon. Uh, there are very, various hormonal approaches that people are working on. And as I'll talk about it in a minute, we are hoping to hear about a large um, um, study in early stage breast cancer patients with PARP inhibitors, and that data will inform how we think about using these drugs as for um, uh, prevention. I will talk about uh, salpingectomy or uh, preventative removal of the fallopian tubes next. So I think this has been a topic of great interest uh, for individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations, which is, can I just take out my fallopian tubes, leave my ovaries in place, and then once I go through menopause, have my ovaries removed? And the short answer as a clinician is, I really, really hope to be able to tell someone that uh, one day. I can't quite tell people that yet. Um, and there are these ongoing studies that are looking at this issue. So the, the premise of this, as many of you have heard, is that the origin of most, of most but maybe not all, and we're not exactly sure of the percentage point, uh, of high-grade serous ov ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tube. And the idea is if you take out the fallopian tube, you can prevent ovarian cancer. And actually, we, we do know uh, that in the general population, if you've had your tubes removed, uh, you do have a decreased risk of ovarian cancer. And the question is, how good is it in individuals who are at very high risk for ovarian cancer, like BRCA1 and 2 carriers? So there was an initial study called WIS, Women Choosing Surgical Prevention. Uh, this was led by Karen Liu out at MD Anderson, and we were one of the participating sites. And this first examined just like, is it safe to take out the fallopian tubes? Do you have a lot of complications? You know, if you take out the fallopian tubes first and then go back and take out the ovaries, how much trouble you ha do you have? And by the way, um, do people, do you harm the ovaries in any way? Do people get menopausal symptoms? And what we've seen from this study uh, to date is that, you know, it appears safe and women don't have menopausal symptoms if you leave their ovaries in place. So those are all good things. 
But the real question we all want to know is whether you can leave the ovaries in place and safely avoid cancer. And here, this will take a much larger trial because many of the patients, at least the, many of my patients that enrolled on WISP, might have their fallopian tubes out, but then they still had their ovaries out when we would normally recommend it. For instance, for BRCA2, we recommend ovarian removal between ages 40 and 45. So we might have had women take out their fallopian tubes at age 37, but still take their ovaries out at 45. So them not getting cancer didn't really prove the, the point. Um, so there's a, a number of different studies that are uh, going on. There's something called WISP2, there's TUBA2 in the US, and there's a trial from the NRG and that will also, uh, uh, which has really uh, has just opened. Um, the PI here is a, a man named Doug Levine at NYU, but the trial pathologist is our own Arani Drapkin at the University of Pennsylvania. So this is gonna be a very important study. And I, I spent more time on this than some of the other slides because there were several questions in advance about this issue. It makes it hard for me as a clinician. I want to have these data. I want a lot of 3,000 people to go on this study. And I want enough women to keep their ovaries in until after age 50 and after natural menopause that I can tell people it's safe. But when I have an individual woman in front of me, I'm still strongly recommending that she have her ovaries out at the standard ages that we state because of the strong evidence we have about how helpful it is. So it is, I know that sounds uh, contradictory, uh, but that's sort of where we are. And so we, we will generate this data, um, but we, we don't have it all yet. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is therapeutics. Um, I, I think you, uh, again, those of you who have joined prior calls know that these PERP inhibitors um, work by action of something called synthetic lethality. And by that, we mean if you block two different pathways, you get cell death. But if you block one pathway or the other pathway, you don't. So here's a little bit of how this works. If you have DNA damage by just living your life, you know, radiation or alcohol or cigarette smoke, um, in a cell uh, that is normal, that does not have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, what happens is that uh, there is um, an ability of that cell to restore that DNA damage. And even if you give a PARP inhibitor, it doesn't do anything and the cell is fine because it can tolerate, if you will, one hit. But in a cell that has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, that damage, the DNA damage, it remains. And then when you give a PARP inhibitor, uh, that results in cell death. So again, knocking out two different um, DNA damage repair pathways, both by a PARP inhibitor and by the, the BRCA mutation results in cell death. Uh, whereas in this case, one pathway is maintained, the BRCA1 and 2 pathway, the other pathway is not, and the cell survives. Now, what we've found out over the last number of years is that these, these do work in BRCA1 and 2 related cancers. And in fact, there's multiple approvals by the FDA uh, for drugs in this space. For breast cancer, we have two PARP inhibitors, olaparib and talozoparib, and pancreatic olaparib, in ovarian cancer, olaparib, recaparib, and niraparib, which is approved more broadly than just for BRCA1 and 2. Um, and uh, these also, in ovarian cancer, these also have more broad approvals. And in prostate cancer, olaparib and recaparib. And so we still have a lot of ways to go about making these drugs work better and work longer, um, but these have been really exciting. And the idea that this has all happened since 2014 is, is really pretty exciting. But we want to do better. And so at Vassar, we now have a clinical trials unit devoted just to genetically driven, uh, genetic oriented clinical trials, well, which is uh, uh, pretty unique and exciting. So you can understand, and you know, there's going to be no quizzes on these slides, uh, but if we look at a disease like pancreatic cancer, we now have multiple trials that are available uh, for individuals with specific genetic mutations. Um, and they can be in multiple genes like BRCA1 and 2 and PALB2. Um, this is a trial, a Planeza trial for those who have mutations in something called an ATM gene. We're looking at new therapies. This trial is not quite open yet, um, but this uh, may be particularly beneficial. This particular drug may be particularly beneficial for individuals who have already progressed on PARP inhibitors. 
my colleague Kim Reese Bender um, is very active in all of these trials and is looking at what we call adjuvant therapy, individuals who have early stage resected pancreatic cancer and whether or not um, a PARP inhibitor will help in that area. Um, so that's just an example in pancreas. Um, in prostate cancer, we have, again, multiple studies uh, for BRCA1 and 2 um, and other genetically susceptibility patients um, in breast cancer as well um, and ovarian cancer. Uh, so just, you know, for physicians on the phone, if you have individuals with mutations in these genes and you're looking for clinical trials, um, uh, please uh, contact us. Or if you're a patient and looking for trials, we'd be happy to see if one of our trials would work for you. Apart from the specific cancer types, some of our trials are sort of tumor agnostic. And so if uh, someone has, for instance, uh, uh, lung cancer or colon cancer and a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, uh, we have a, a trial for that. And again, for prevention, we have our vaccine trial open and the denosumab or Prolia trial um, that's uh, about to begin. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of the active areas that we have. To highlight just a few trials, my colleague Fiona Simpkins has specifically looked at um, ATR inhibitors plus PARP inhibitors in, in the CAPRI trial. And this has multiple different um, uh, cohorts, including individuals that uh, have disease that's PARP resistant. And this is based on her primary uh, research out of the laboratory. And she's uh, published in uh, her initial work in Nature Communications, uh, it's a very prestigious journal uh, for the basic science work, and has now submitted her, uh, uh, her clinical trial uh, to gynecological oncology in, in collaboration uh, with one of our other colleagues, Pyle Shaw. Um, Olympia, and sorry, the formatting got a little funny here, but Olympia is a trial that looks for at early stage breast cancer patients using after they after an individual finishes all their routine chemotherapy, randomly assigning those women and men to either a lab rib or a sugar pill. Um, and we're hoping to hear these results soon. And this will give us very good data on toxicity so that we can then start thinking about giving it to people without cancer. So time will tell on that. Uh, my colleagues, Daniel Powell and Pyle Shaw, have looked at CART T cells. So these are genetically engineered T cells to try to um, attack ovarian cancer. This isn't specific to BRCA1 and 2, uh, but obviously given the high risk of ovarian cancer uh, in BRCA1 and 2, it's relevant. So these T cells specifically target the folate receptor alpha. And as you can see, we go through in, um, in these types of trials, we start with a low dose of the, the type of, um, of cells, and then we change um, what we do. So we give different types of chemotherapy, um, uh, lymphocyte depleting chemotherapy to see if that would work better. And as you can see, this has been um, um, proceeding along quite nicely. And for the six patients who, uh, who have received um, this kind of, this uh, have, who, who have been able to be imaged at their first time point so far, have had stable disease, which in these highly um, refractory patients is, is, is actually quite exciting. So time will tell, we have more work to do here as well. All right, now basic science. You know, sometimes basic science uh, can be tough to sort of explain in a few words for sure, but the basic idea is that we wanna figure out how BRCA1 and BRCA2 interact with other cellular processes and how they interact with the, the, the immune system. And we wanna understand why tumors develop. Why do they develop in certain tissues? And the more that we understand, the better potential we have for understanding prevention. And why are these tumors may or may not be responsive to therapy? So this is an, a, 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 a one of the ongoing projects that we have. This is uh, in Kate Nathanson's lab. And this is using a novel uh, technique called CODEX, which just allows us to take the same sample of tumor tissue. So you can kind of see here that these two slides, hopefully you can see my arrow, these are the same slice of tissue, but they're overlaid with um, antibodies to various uh, compounds that are, are, are coded with different colors. And you can do this repetitively. And so you can start to really kind of see these are DNA damage markers. 
And these are immune cell markers. And so you can start to really look at a very specific level of how immune cells and, uh, and the tumor cells interrelate to each other and how those different markers go up and down. You can also you know, see differences between, say, estrogen receptor positive and triple negative breast cancer, even within the BRCA1 and 2 tumors. Uh, so this is really important to understand the composition of immune cells in these tumors and their relationships to DNA damage in the tumors and to determine if the immune cells themselves have ongoing DNA damage. Um, so again, this is um, uh, using this novel technique and we are hoping to learn a great deal more about it. Uh, Roger Greenberg has published in Nature uh, Cell Biology uh, this year, work looking at uh, a different pathway. Here we're looking at ALC1 as a potential new vulnerability in BRCA mutant cancers. So in the same way, PARP inhibitors in combination with BRCA1 and 2 lead to cell death. There is the possibility here of developing ALC1 inhibitors uh, in combination with BRCA1 and 2 uh, to lead to cell death. So this is a, you know, this is a uh, important area. Uh, currently there are no uh, actual drugs, but this would be the idea is now that this basic work has been done, uh, whether or not uh, 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 drugs can be developed to then be tested. Uh, Roger has also shown, has been published in Nature and Cell Reports, uh, that DNA damage enhances immune, uh, immune um, immunogenicity. And this is uh, uh, potentially um, uh, complicated, but we do know that, that what he has shown is that BRCA mutations enhance sort of immune responses to PARP inhibitors. Now, what that means for combinations with immune therapies, um, we don't quite know yet. Um, we have published in Lancet Oncology this year a trial um, uh, combining PARP inhibitors with immune therapy. And, um, you know, we're still, it was a relatively small study, and the response rate wasn't dramatically elevated from PARP inhibitors alone, but definitely much more work needs to be done in that area. My colleague, Kara Maxwell, um, also funded by Basser, has been specifically looking at prostate cancer relevant to BRCA1 and 2. And here, she's really taking on uh, one of the huge advantages to Penn, something called the Penn Medicine Biobank. The Penn Medicine Biobank is a very large biobank, uh, which has allowed for whole exome sequencing of a large number of people with, with connection to the electronic medical record. And in that way, she's able, she was able to sort of select out uh, 2,300, 2,400 men with prostate cancer and associated controls and look at genes and whether or not they were related to prostate cancer and to what degree they were. So we can take, for example, something like a, a gene called CHECK2. And CHECK2, there's been sort of a lot of uh, discussion about whether or not this is associated uh, with, uh, uh, a, with prostate cancer. And here, we really don't see any association. Um, and, but here you see that the largest association is for BRCA2, uh, which is known, but it starts to give you a better sense in an unselected population. And because Penn has a large number of African-American patients or self-identified uh, Black patients, uh, we're able to start to get a sense of what um, this might mean um, in different, uh, different uh, races and ethnicities. Kara has also looked at how often in tumors that are not specifically known to be associated with BRCA1 and 2, so tumors beyond breast, ovarian, prostate, and pancreatic cancer, how often those tumors sort of have lost the second copy of BRCA1 and 2, which is a, um, a, a potential marker of whether or not, if you will, the BRCA1 or 2 mutation caused the cancer to develop. And here you can see that only about 20% of the time in tumors other than breast, ovarian, prostate, and pancreatic cancer did you see that loss. Again, much more work to do here to really understand what it means because it, it just may be that if you have a lung cancer and you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, that lung cancer may have occurred by other means and not have anything to do with BRCA1 and 2, in which case PARP inhibitors may not benefit you. So it's really important for us to understand this better. And finally, we're almost done. I swear we're gonna to get to the questions in a minute. Um, 
uh, Kate Nathanson and I uh, were involved in a large trial um, uh, led by uh, Fergus Couch at Mayo Clinic, looking at 32,000 breast cancer patients and 32,000 controls, and looking at of various genes, including BRCA1 and 2, to see what their risks were, and also to see how often you find them. This is, unlike uh, other things that have been reported, a completely unselected cohort. So these are not people who met the criteria to go to have clinical testing. These were not only young women. These were just women in the general population with breast cancer. And what we learned is if you take sort of 12 genes that are, that are at least putatively associated with breast cancer, all in all breast cancer cases, about 5% have them. If you actually just look at BRCA1, BRCA2, and the closest thing we have to BRCA3, which is PALB2, uh, you end up then with a little under 3% having um, either a BRCA1, BRCA2, or PALB2 mutation when you have breast cancer. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of the fact that it's not super common, um, but there are definitely things that we know increase the risk, like having estrogen receptor negative disease, having a family history of either breast or ovarian cancer, being of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, having a young onset of, of breast cancer, for instance. This trial, this study also allowed us to say in the general population, not super selected for high risk, what, is the, what are the risks of cancer? And here you can see that this is uh, uh, kept as an odds ratio. The odds ratios for BRCA1 and 2 are high at 7.6 and 5.2. But some of the other genes, and I, I mean, mentioned this specifically because these are some of the questions that were asked in advance, Something, a gene, mutations in a gene like ATM, the odds ratio is 1.8. And just so you know, having a first degree relative with, uh, with breast cancer is an odds ratio of around two. So yes, this is an increased risk, but it's not that high. Um, and same with uh, this gene called CHECK2. And to put that in a different perspective, these are the lifetime risks of cancer. And you can see that here for BRCA1 and BRCA2, the lifetime risks end up you know, about 50% here, a little under that for BRC2. And for ATM, you know, it's in the 20% range and for uh, uh, CHECK2 about 25% by age 80. Now, the, the key here is that family history matters. So the higher, the more family members you have with cancer, the higher these numbers may go. And that's why we're uh, trying to understand this better. In addition, we have a very large trial it's called PROMPT, the Prospective Registry of Multiplex Testing. We've enrolled more than 8,500 patients. This is a collaboration with Memorial Dana-Farber and Mayo Clinic. And these uh, individuals are highly motivated. They have mutations in all sorts of genes or variants of unknown significance. And we're doing a lot of work to understand what individuals are doing with this information, particularly when we're beyond genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, and finally, I just want to highlight that we have published in, in many extremely prestigious journals, Science, Nature, Lancet Oncology, JAMA, um, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, so we feel at Bassard that we are doing highly important and productive research. And we're doing this in combination with our colleagues throughout the world, with our patients who are avid participants and with our donors who help support our work. And so we are really grateful for all of that. Now, I'm gonna now launch into some, uh, some questions. And again, I am keeping an eye on the chat as well. So feel free to, to, to launch uh, things in the chat. The first question that came up several times was a little bit of the elephant in the room, which is uh, what about COVID? Uh, and there are a lot of various questions about COVID. Uh, but I'll uh, take a few of them here. Does COVID have any different effect on individuals who have BRCA mutations? And the answer to that is not that we know of, at least nothing obvious. As I mentioned through this, we are looking at whether or not individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations might have a slightly different impact of like how they respond to flu vaccines or things like that. Um, and, and we were working on that before COVID hit, but nonetheless, we have no evidence that people with BRCA1 or 2 mutations would have a different outcome to COVID. 
In addition, there is no, absolutely no reason for BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers not to get COVID vaccines. mRNA, the mRNA vaccines that are available um, are a really cool, innovative work, actually in part developed uh, by Drew Weissman, uh, Katerlina, I can never pronounce her name, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And, but they don't integrate with your DNA. They don't change your DNA. They just express the protein. And so um, these vaccines are, are, are safe. Um, I've been fortunate to get mine as, a, as an oncologist, and I encourage everyone to do so. That's not to say they can't be without their side effects, uh, but COVID has been a devastating illness. Um, and, uh, and again, this is uh, the vaccine question. And the third question, which I didn't put on here, was a lot of questions about timing of, of things like surgeries, timing of, of MRIs. Uh, and here, uh, we never stopped doing breast MRIs in BRCA1 and 2 carriers through the pandemic. And you shouldn't, if you're due for your screening, you should definitely get it. Decisions about surgery, um, you know, I think particularly in the, the early days uh, were challenging, uh, but now almost all centers, we know how to keep our patients safe um, and uh, you can make sort of your decisions, um, you know, based on, on, your, on, on, on what your priorities are. Uh, but I think that um, at this point in time, uh, we do feel that patients are very, very safe in hospitals the way that we're, we're handling things. Another big series of questions uh, was relate on how to um, start, um, how to deal with screening and when to start screening. And, and, and this is from one particular study of uh, Kuchenberg and um, Antonis Antonou in, in JAMA. Uh, we were not involved in this work, uh, but just to give you an idea, this followed a, a large cohort of individuals, um, you know, in total uh, about 2,300 uh, uh, BRCA1 mutation carriers and 1,600 BRCA2 mutation carriers and followed them forward. So when they were initially seen, they didn't have cancer and they were followed forward. And here you can see that the cumulative risk of developing breast cancer in a BRCA1 carrier by age 30 is about 4%. And that's the same uh, with BRCA2. Here, you know, it has uh, the risk of developing breast cancer under age 20 is exceedingly, exceedingly low. And I know knock wood, throw salt. I have not seen one. Um, the ones that I've seen younger than that have had a different gene mutation called TP53. So this is why we generally start at 25. I know, you know, and I think what some of the comments were is that, you know, that, that there are, you know, the occasional patient, there is the occasional patient uh, that is diagnosed earlier than that. Uh, they are even within BRCA1 and 2 uh, quite rare, but we do take into account family history. If there is an exceptionally young cancer in the family, uh, we'll often start five years before um, that, although I've never started younger than uh, 21. Um, and this also uh, leads to the timing of oophorectomy. And these are why, you know, sometimes people wonder why is there a difference for BRCA1 and 2, and this is why the risk of developing ovarian cancer is higher in BRCA1 and it occurs earlier than in BRCA2. In this particular study, no cancers were seen in BRCA2 prior to age 40, but in general, um, this curve, if you look at other studies, starts to go up around 45. And that's why 35 to 40 is the timing for BRCA1 and 40 to 45 is the timing for BRCA2. All right. And then, okay, so I'm gonna take a pause now, not to go to mine, I'm gonna go through some of the questions um, that are coming in on the chat so I can alternate between the two. Um, yeah, so this is such a great point that I'm gonna read it out. How are researchers helping to educate oncologists and breast surgeons to give a positive outlook to triple negative breast cancer diagnosed patients? This is an ongoing problem. Patients being told this is the worst type and survival rate is not good. You know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that um, the, the I, you know, if, you know, cancers, triple negative breast cancers, you know, that are diagnosed not, you know, that do, do not, uh, individuals who do not have metastatic disease, um, the cure rate, you know, particularly for stage one cancers is quite high. Um, and I, I have had actually this talk with some people about we have to be really careful about worse prognosis sort of relative to what, but I gotta tell you, if you have a stage one breast cancer, 
um, you're doing quite well compared to pancreatic cancer or lung cancer. So I agree with you um, that we need to do sort of a better job in uh, describing that um, and to make sure that people have an accurate um, uh, answer, a, a accurate understanding of their prognosis. Um, another question uh, was, um, let's see. Um, okay, uh, another question is, was, which is also a great question, <laughs> is whether or not uh, panel tests are the right idea. And when, for those of you who uh, don't know, when we talk about panel tests, I showed you this list of genes, right? Um, I'm gonna show you, where did it go? Uh, here, okay. So here's a list of 12 genes, but many people who have breast cancer now are tested with panels of up to 30 genes. And I just wanna kind of point out a few things here that there are genes uh, that, um, that don't make this list because they had no association with breast cancer risk like NBN and even things like RAD51 C and D, which are complicated, there's no association with breast cancer risk here. They actually do have some association with triple negative breast cancer, but here there's no association with breast cancer risk. So when we start to test for like 30 gene panels and we include on them a bunch of genes that have no association with breast cancer risk, what we're really doing then is doing population screening. So, you know, I, I've, I've given several lectures on this and I do think that uh, we have a tendency at, in our clinic to do a smaller panel and to really focus it on genes that um, are clearly associated with breast cancer risk and also uh, that we know kind of what to do with the information. Uh, and so there are some individuals who are like, test me for as many genes as you can think of and I can handle uncertainty. But for a lot of individuals, what you get is an uncertain result and often you have mismanagement based on that uncertain result. Uh, so it's um, a really great point. Next question um, uh, uh, is, uh, if you have a preventative oophorectomy, is it okay to do HRT? Okay, so I'm a pragmatist related to this. There, I, I can't imagine that there is ever going to be a randomized clinical trial comparing individuals who've had their oophorectomy to get hormone replacement therapy versus to not get hormone replacement therapy. So first of all, let's we're talking really just in patients who have not had breast cancer. So that's a more complicated issue. But if you've never had breast cancer and you have your ovaries removed and you know you, you've you've gone through premature menopause and you've now are going to have much less cumulative exposure to estrogen than you normally would have in your life. And very early oophorectomy can lead to problems with your heart and your bones, et cetera. So although this has to be an informed discussion, I, do, I absolutely offer hormone replacement therapy to those individuals. There are then some nuances for, and by the way, there's this big study called the Women's Health Initiative Study, which randomly assigned women to HRT versus no HRT. But in that study, women were 63. They had gone through their whole natural life of estrogen, and then they took more. That's not the, that is not the same as someone who goes through menopause at 37, okay? And um, it is also true that in that study, women who took estrogen by itself didn't have an increased risk of, of breast cancer. So talk to your doctor, but, but I do not view it as an absolute contraindication, and I do talk to uh, my patients about it. All right, so we're gonna go, now I'm gonna go back to, to my slides and I'll get back to the live questions in a minute, um, but I'm gonna try to answer the ones that people did in advance. So one was, what is the role of CRISPR? Uh, for those of you who don't know, CRISPR is a way to edit specific genes in a cell. Um, and it's a incredibly, incredibly powerful technique for research because you can put genes in, you can take genes out, and so, you know, the, the hope is that you can then start to do things with live, you know, people. So there's two, there's three kind of ways to think about CRISPR. One is already being used. And in fact, the first clinical trial using CRISPR technology is being done at the University of Pennsylvania, doing CRISPR in these CART T cells, which are T cells that are taken out of your body, manipulated, and then put back in to attack cancer. CART T cells, seem to be uh, work particularly well in leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma. We don't exactly know it's their space in breast and ovarian cancer yet, but uh, there are trials 
manipulating T cells outside of the body and then putting them back in, okay? And so that is like a start. The second thing that people are interested in is whether you could take an embryo and manipulate the embryo. And there, the answer is a hard no right now because there's too much collateral damage right now. There's too many errors that are generated along the way. Plus, right now, you can go through in vitro fertilization which you and, and, and have the embryo sitting there, which you'd have to do whether you did CRISPR or you did selection, meaning if you generate the embryos, you can test the embryos and you know which ones have the gene mutation and which ones don't, and you can re-implant the embryo that doesn't have the gene mutation. So CRISPR for embryos is not ready for prime time. And the other thing is people are like, well, why can't we like CRISPR all my breast cells? And if you will, you know, get the gene back in. And that just becomes like a technology problem. Like how do you do that? And how do you get every cell um, done? So stay tuned, um, but uh, uh, that's, we're, we're, we're kind of working on it. Pancreatic cancer screening was brought up in several questions. The current NCCN guidelines, the National Comprehensive Cancer Center guidelines, specifically talk about individuals with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation or PALB2, by the way, mutation who have a first degree relative with pancreatic cancer are good at, uh, candidates for pancreatic cancer screening. That includes either an abdominal MRI or an endoscopic ultrasound. In general, this screening starts at 50 if you, if you have a first or second degree relative or five to 10 years earlier than the earliest onset in your family. Um, in individuals that do not have a family history of pancreatic cancer, it is definitely more controversial. We do have an ongoing study here, although the study is really keeping track of things and we do bill out to insurance. So we need more data. There's also a lot of interest in liquid biopsies. Again, that's what we're using our biobank to try to answer these questions. And there are commercial entities that are looking at screening using liquid biopsies. So I think that in five years, we're gonna have a lot better options um, than we currently do. People asked about other genes like CHECK2 and ATM, and I, I don't necessarily have the time to talk about them in detail today, but again, these are very different from BRCA1 and 2. The risks are much lower, um, and they do need to be thought of very differently in the discussions about um, management. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, um, okay, so so there's there's... I'm just going to be, I just be doing mastectomy versus silent. Okay, there, there's a lot of questions about, if you will, mastectomy versus um, surveillance. These are extremely, extremely personal decisions. Um, what we, what we, you know, and the one thing that for doctors, it's always, if you will, easiest for us to strongly recommend things if we believe that that uh, procedure is going to live in people living longer. So, for the ovaries, the reason that um, we are so pushy and we know we're pushy is because individuals, uh, uh, ovarian cancer screening right now is not good. Uh, most ovarian cancers are caught late and most women with ovarian cancer um, die of their ovarian cancer, with late stage ovarian cancer, die of their cancers. And we're trying to change that obviously. So we, that's why we kind of strongly recommend oophorectomy. For mastectomy, breast cancer screening, including breast MRI once a year with a mammogram sort of six months later, alternating like that, including physical exams, um, that most more than 90% of the time, if a cancer is detected, it's detected at an early stage. And early stage breast cancers in zero, stage zero one have a you know, 95 to 95% you know, 10 year survival. And so um, it's very flipped from ovarian cancer. Now, having said that, if you're diagnosed with a, a breast cancer, even if it's at an early stage, particularly BRCA1, cancers are generally triple negative, BRCA, uh, 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 estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 negative, and therefore they usually uh, require us to give chemotherapy to get that great outcome. So screening um, doesn't prevent cancers, it detects them early and you still need therapy. The question of whether or not there's a survival benefit is actually really tricky because we don't have randomized trials. And in the studies that have been uh, published to date, the women who were, didn't get a mastectomy, they didn't have data on whether they got MRIs or not. And so, um, but even there, the absolute benefit uh, from mastectomy, you know, if, if you will, if you chose screening, 
versus mastectomy at age 70, the number of people alive in the, you know, in the mastectomy group that weren't alive in the MRI group is, is small. So for instance, for BRCA2, it's two to three in a hundred. Um, and again, that's estimated. We don't know the actual uh, number. So uh, I hope that that um, is, is helpful. Um, let me see. Another question was uterine cancer risk and hysterectomy. Um, the, uh, there, has, there have been a couple of studies suggesting a very small increased risk of uterine cancer, for beer, particularly for BRCA1 mutation carriers, where the lifetime risk is in the 2.5% range. That, that number is, is small enough that, that, in general, there's not a routine recommendation for hysterectomy. It depends on a lot of different things. Um, whether or not you have a uterus impacts what kind of hormone replacement therapy you get. But it's also true that if you've had three C-sections, doing a hysterectomy is going to be more complicated with potentially uh, more um, potential complications and a longer recovery time than if you haven't. So it's a very individualized decision that needs to be taken into account with your physicians, including issues of your personal history, your plans for hormone replacement therapy, whether it's a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Okay, HRT I kind of covered already. Um, let me go back to this. All right. Um, answer live. Uh, um, okay. Uh, this is a great question too. Um, they're all great questions, by the way. Um, if you've already had an oophorectomy and a mastectomy, what else do you need to do? Um, so there is a very small uh, residual risk of developing breast cancer. That range is one to 2% for that. You know, we just do chest wall exams. Someone asked about MRIs. We generally don't do MRIs with the exception of if you have an implant in place, sometimes that's done for implant integrity reasons, but it's really not done for breast cancer screening reasons. Um, having your ovaries out, there's a very small residual risk of developing something called a primary perineal cancer, which is like an ovarian cancer, but we don't do any routine screening for that either. For BRCA2, there's a small increased risk of melanoma. So we generally, depending on your skin type, might recommend a yearly dermatology exam. For If you have a family history of pancreatic cancer, we recommend that as well. For men, we recommend prostate cancer screening in addition. And oftentimes I'm also sort of keeping an eye on people's overall health because if they've had an early oophorectomy, sometimes you know their primary care doctor is looking at their age and not the fact that they've already had their ovaries out uh, for 10 years. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. Um, uh, someone brought up a, a, a TP53 issue of uh, the founder mutation of Brazil. Feel free to, to send me a note off, offline about that one um, because I'm happy to. Um, uh, um, uh, there is a, a comment uh, made about, um, I'm not sure exactly the comment, but uh, when we population screening, I, I, I apologize if I didn't use the word quite right. When we're talking about population screening, we were talking about people who don't have a family history of breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, so I'm sorry if the way that I worded that um, uh, didn't feel right. Uh, but but you know anyone can get genetic testing if they uh, want it these days. The test costs $250. Um, the population screening is saying that every patient is man is is basically absolutely should get it. And that is an individual decision from a patient. What we found in our uh, Ashkenazi Jewish founder mutation study was we were actually surprised by how many people did not want to get testing. And so one could argue that that is something that requires a lot more education uh, and outreach um, uh, to, to do. Um, all right, so um, uh, there was a comment I made uh, that someone uh, stated, you know, at a triple negative breast cancer talk a few years ago, one research stated it's rare to develop triple negative breast cancer more than once. Um, yes, I'm not sure. Uh, so that depends. If you have a BRCA1 mutation, 85% um, of the time, BRCA1 mutation carriers get triple negative breast cancers. And if they do not have a bilateral mastectomy at that time, they have an increased risk of developing a second cancer and that it generally is a triple negative. So it really depends on the details, um, uh, uh, the details of the situation. 
Uh, another question is that uh, whether we have a list of trials. Yes, we've been uh, trying to do a better job keeping our trials updated. Um, and Sam has been working on that. And so uh, you can check the Basser website and we're trying to have a, a, a um, uh, section there. I wanted to answer these two questions specifically that were done in advance. I'm not sure I'm going to get to any more of the chat functions, but uh, an individual asked about fertility treatment and cancer and, and particularly BRCA1 and 2. And there's many sort of levels of this. One is we don't have any evidence that fertility treatments increase the risk of, of breast cancer in BRCA1 and 2 carriers. Um, and the, the data that we have best about fertility treatments is all in the Nordic countries where they have extremely good databases. Um, the second issue is that if someone is uh, diagnosed with breast cancer and um, wants to do fertility preservation, we do that. We do that all the time. We do it before we do chemotherapy. And we have no evidence that there's an increased risk of um, um, uh, an increased risk of cancer recurring in that setting. The second, the third issue is um, that if you've had breast cancer, there is no evidence that. Um, an individual who has breast cancer that then gets pregnant has an increased risk of recurrence. That is, pregnancy does not increase the risk of relapse. Some individuals who have estrogen receptor positive cancers wish to come off their hormonal therapy before the standard course is done in order to have children. And in that case, coming off your hormonal therapy early can increase your risk of developing a, a recurrence but it's not the pregnancy, if that makes any sense. So these are complex decisions and discussions that I have all the time uh, with my patients. Another question was if you're diagnosed with breast cancer and you're found you have a BRCA one or two mutation, but you still you know, wish to keep your breasts and, have your, and, and be able to breastfeed later, that's absolutely uh, a possibility. Treating, when we talk about bilateral mastectomy for BRCA one and two, we're talking about um, decreasing the chance of developing a second breast cancer in the same breast or in the opposite breast. But in terms of treating the breast cancer right in front of you, radiation does do the job. So we definitely have had people who, for instance, are diagnosed with breast cancer, go through fertility preservation, get their chemotherapy, are doing well. Usually we wait a couple of years, they get pregnant, they have their kids, they breastfeed, and then they might have a bilateral mastectomy later. So again, we try to individualize these things. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, this was a recurrent theme. Basically, are things gonna get better? Are you gonna have better options? Well, I certainly, you know, that's what we're all about is better options so that in 10 years, people don't need to make the same kind of decisions uh, that um, people are having to make right now. Um, and that's what uh, the basic research is for. That's what our prevention uh, programs are for. And so uh, we're really hopeful. And again, you know, we are committed to uh, making sure that more people have access uh, to genetic testing. So with that, I think I'm right on time. Um, this will be recorded. Um, I will go through all the rest of the questions um, and try to uh, make um, uh, uh, and and. Um, uh, and, and make sure that I respond to those. And I'm sorry if I did not uh, get to every last question. So with that, I'm gonna show you that uh, this takes a village. We have a large number of people in the Basser Center in our genetics clinical research unit, genetic counselors, our research team, and that's a long list of names, but I think it's sometimes better uh, to be able to see it uh, like this, which is, uh, and this doesn't even include everybody, uh, but it's a lot of people and uh, we're really trying to make forward progress. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for your attention. And again, we'll, we'll get back to these uh, residual questions. Thank you very much.